Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we make it our business to help you take dominion over your money and your life. Thank you so much for tuning in to another fantastic episode of the show. We're grateful to have your eyes and your ears with us because the truth of the matter is you could be listening and watching elsewhere, but the fact that you're here rocking with the His and Her Money Show once again, we want you to know that we appreciate you. Do us a favor. If you hear something awesome today and hint, hint, you absolutely will, make sure that you share it. Be a good friend, be a good neighbor, be a good family member and share what you learn from this episode with them by just hitting the share button or putting it on your social media platforms. And if you do that, tag us at his and her money on all platforms, and we'll be sure to show you love right back. I'm super excited about today's episode. I have a special guest who I've been watching and admiring from afar for quite a long time. And now he's here with us today. We're going to be talking about life, the life aspect, because we talk about dominion over your money and your life. And so for a lot of us, uh, there's been some times and some situations where things didn't go our way. Things became super challenging. And for some of us, it took us a while to recover. And for even more of us, we're still in the recovery process. And so we have a special guest by the name of Paul Daughtry. He's a pastor in Oklahoma, Victory Church. And he's also the author of a brand new book called Mind Games, where he's super transparent about his own journey with mental health and some struggles that he has had to overcome in his own life. And he wants you to learn some lessons and principles that you can apply to your life because Sooner or later, we're all going to deal with it if we're not dealing with it right now. So this is a super imperative episode. And we want you to be prepared to take notes for all the nuggets that will be dropped today. So get your pen and paper ready or get your notes app open because I don't want you to miss not one nugget that Pastor Paul is going to give us. So get ready. I'm going to go with Pastor Paul and we're going to have a great conversation about mind games and getting control of our thought life and getting control of our mental health. So stay tuned. Hey, Pastor Paul, welcome to the His and Her Money Show, sir. Hey, honored to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Super glad to have you here. Been admiring your work for quite a long time, and I'm excited about the work that you've now completed for the masses to learn from in your new book, Mind Games. But uh, some people are being introduced to you for the very first time right here and right now. So for them, would you mind kind of saying hello and then letting them know what you're all about? Absolutely. Well, like you said, my name is Paul and first book out ever, Mind Games. I'm a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma of a church called Victory. Uh, the church started in 1981 before I was ever born. My parents started it, built this amazing, incredible ministry um, with a Bible college and a school and a camp and a dream center in the impoverished area of our city where we every day serve the poor and help the needy and do after school care for kids and that's all been a part of the ministry for many years. Uh, but about 15 years ago, my dad suddenly passed away of lymphoma cancer. And at a young age, I was thrust into leadership. And I walked through a bunch of different mental, emotional challenges. Our ministry went through a massive uh, turnover. We lost thousands of people. We went through an intense layoff. Uh, you know, our school was one of the largest private schools when my dad was alive. And we had to lay off 120 employees in a matter of 18 months. It was painful. It was dark. And that was right after the housing market crashed. Uh, my dad passed away right around in 2009, kind of the year after that. And it was just a hard season. And through all that, I battled depression. I battled suicidal thoughts. I battled anxiety, panic, and then just feelings of hopelessness, discouragement, wondering if our church or the finances of our ministry would ever turn around. Um, and at a young age, my wife and I, we had just gotten married two weeks before my dad died and she was serving with me in the church. So it was a lot on a young couple. Um, and yet God's grace ended up really helping us get through all of that. And I share my story in my book, Mind Games, uh, where I talk about what it was like going through all those trials, struggles, and each mind game I faced, and then how I got the victory over it. The name of our church is called Victory, and I really talk about getting victory on the inside. If you can get the victory in your mind, you can get victory in every area of your life. And, uh, you know, I was just watching uh, the Dallas Cowboys the other day on, on TV, and I was listening to the news anchors. They said, uh, everything's a mind game. They said, you know, if Prescott wins in the mind, 
he wins on the field. And they said it in the national championship with McCarthy playing for Michigan. They said he goes in between each quarter, he goes to his mentalist coach, his mind coach, and his coach helps him have these mantras, these confessions that helps him get the victory on the inside. Because most of the battles we face, whether it's in our relationships, our marriage, our family, our physical health, uh, our career, all of those battles, they start between the ears. If we don't win in here, then we're going to lose out there. And so my book is really about winning in your mind, winning those mind games of hopelessness, fear, panic, anxiety, stress, worry, depression, uh, feelings of, you know, comparison, unworthiness, inadequacy, insecurity, the lack of courage, the lack of confidence. And then my personal story is all of those battles. So I kind of weave the Bible stories and scriptures and then things that I personally discovered. And then a lot of the counseling and therapy sessions I went through in my own journey um, are packed into this book. And it's all about winning on the inside. How do we become receptive to the fact that maybe we're in a battle in our mind that we may not be winning? Because for some people, especially people of faith, you yourself, when you entered into this battle, you were in ministry. You were raised by parents who were in ministry. And so a lot of times people related to faith or just even life, you're, you're, you're told to be strong. You're told to suppress feelings. You're told to keep putting one foot in front of the other, not necessarily deal with the situations at hand. So how can we become receptive to the fact that maybe possibly we think we're doing okay by continuing to progress forward in life, but maybe we need to pause and address what's actually going on internally. That's and that's a huge part of it is the faith community is notorious for just faithing our way through it. Just, you know, faith it till you make it. And that is a good, honestly, I think that's a great weapon at our disposal as believers to use faith. But using faith doesn't mean brushing aside the issues of our mental and emotional health and, you know, ignoring counseling and ignoring the practical tools that can help us have victory besides just confessing we have victory. You know, it's it's great that we have prayer. It's great that we have worship. It's great that we have the word of God to meditate on and confess. And I talk about all of those things. Those things were huge weapons that I used to see the victory. But I also used practical tools like going to counseling, sitting with a counselor and realizing that I had childhood trauma that I had not dealt with that was affecting my adulthood behavior. And my feelings of who's going to leave me next didn't just spring from my dad suddenly passing uh, because he did leave our, our, our earth, our family, our church suddenly. But I had a fear of losing people dating all the, back, all the way back to when I was seven years old. And I didn't know that until I sat down and took some time to go, you know what? I can believe in God, love Jesus, be a, a faith believer and admit I got some issues to deal with. I, I have an issue with trusting anybody in my life that they're going to be around. I have a trust. I, I had trust issues with loyalty. I was like, I don't know who's going to be here because so many people left our church when my dad passed away. In a short matter of time, I lost lifelong friends that didn't just leave the church. They just left me. They just were like, I'm sorry. I just can't be around the negative, you know, sad you. And I was like, man, so Thankfully, you know, coming through all of that and finding the victory of being able to trust people again, being able to love people, being able to recognize that there are people who come and go in your life um, and and being able to come on the other side of the battles that I was in. I think we're always going to face mind games the rest of our life. I don't think we graduate the battle in the mind. I think, you know, I was sharing this with a friend, my friend, Mike Todd, He's, he and I are going to do a tag team uh, mind games message together this week at our church. And we both pastor in the same city, but Mike and I, we were reflecting on men that we looked up to older pastors, older leaders that we didn't hear them from stage ever admitting their personal battles to the degree that our generation is starting to become more transparent, more vulnerable. And had we known that some of these older generals in the faith actually did face mental and emotional problems. Like 
Billy Graham admits in his book, thankfully, we do have some of these people who did admit that he faced his own depression, even all the way up until his 90s, that he faced thoughts of sadness, loneliness, discouragement. So if, if these thoughts and emotions plague the greatest of Christians, then they probably plague all Christians. They probably come at all of us. So we got to be willing to go, you know what? The truth is, as happy as I might look at church, um, you know, Robin Williams, one of the most funny actors in Hollywood, the biggest smile, and yet inwardly was facing the darkest demons. Uh, we could go through the list. Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade, Whitney Houston, the amount of celebrities that could carry a public persona of, yay, I'm good, all is well, uh, I love my job, I love my life, and yet inwardly be feeling deep feelings and emotions of discouragement, depression, hopelessness, and feelings of just, maybe I just want to throw it all away. And I think we've got to realize that you can hide a lot of things with faith, um, but if you don't reveal it, you can't heal it. You know, if you don't bring it out to the open and go, God, if I'm honest, I'm really discouraged. If I'm honest, I'm really depressed. If I'm honest, I don't want to get out of bed. If I'm honest, I'm still mad at people who hurt my family years ago, you know, whatever those things are. And then allowing the Holy Spirit through counseling, through all the different ways and tools in mind games to, uh, to bring us into a place of victory. Yeah, that's good wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. And I know that this, this book, Mind Games, was birthed out of that moment, uh, out of that season of life where you lost your, your father, which is super devastating. And, and people that have been around his and her money for a while, they know that uh, typically his and her money, there's a his and a her. It's me and my wife. But um, not too long ago, she lost her mom and just really it upended her world. And she just needed to take and still is taking some some time away just to regroup, recover, go through the the grief journey. And some people are in their grief journey right now. They are at that low point that you found yourself because I know that even the way that you found out um, your father was kind of battling it um, on his own without making it public. And so you found out weeks before he ended up passing away and you had to kind of deal with it quickly and the pain and the hurt. And now you got to help your mom because she's taking over. There was a lot going on. You're just about to get married. Uh, you just were married when um, he passed away. So there was a whole lot coming at you at once that made your world go dark. If there's somebody listening who's in a similar spot as that, what was step one for you to even begin this process of getting back on your feet? Yeah. Well, one of the stories that I tell that helped me get back on my feet is before my dad passed, he said to me in the hospital, Paul, um, I see something in you that you may not see. He said, I see you have a calling on your life to preach, to pastor, to help build the church. And I want you to do it with me and mommy, with your mom. And I was like, absolutely, dad. You know, I want to I want to work together with you guys. And I I love serving in the church. I was one of those pastor's kids that wasn't jaded at my dad. I think he had done a good job spending time with his kids to the point where we weren't all, you know, angry at him because of his sacrifice for the church. We all wanted to serve in the church. And um, thankfully, all of us kids, you know, I'm a, one of four kids. I'm the youngest of four. We're all still serving God, still serving in the ministry. And, and so when he said that, I said, Dad, you know, I'm the youngest. I don't feel the most qualified to preach to, to adults, but I'll help you build the church. I'll work with the youth group. I'll work with young adults. I'll work with our missions because I loved doing short-term missions, all that stuff. And he had this amazing ministry that he had raised all this support and this vision. So I was like, there's room in the house for me to serve in other ways. Um, but you, you do the preaching. You're the pastor. You're the visionary. And I said, you're going to get out of the hospital. Everything's going to be fine. And he said, well, I want you to preach this, this weekend while I'm here in the hospital. And I was like, dad, I am unqualified to preach in front of the big service, the adults, you know? And he was like, no, Paul, there's something inside you. He said, you can use my office too. Here's my key. And um, I said, dad, I was like, it's funny because I had a ring of keys when I was the janitor for my university. And I, I was a janitor for about three years when I went to school at, in college. And I said, this is the first time you're giving me keys. I was like, and you're just giving me one key. And I was like, dad, I kind of need more keys than just one to get into the building. And uh, he was like, why do you want more keys? I was like, well, 
because I need access and I'm your own flesh and blood. I had more keys as the janitor than I do working at the church. This is the first t- time you gave me a key. And he kind of laughed and he said, Paul, this is the only key you need. And I didn't think much of it, but I remember working during his passing out of his office and just weeping. I would sit in his office and I felt closer to him in our building than I did going to see his gravestone. People would say, hey, have you gone and visited your dad's gravestone? I was like, no, because he's not there. I was like, I feel his presence more in our church building and in his office than I do there. So sometimes at night I would go up to our church building to go and sit in his office, pray. And then I would go into our auditorium. He built this massive 5,000 seat auditorium the year before he died. And after he passed, that auditorium started losing a lot of people. And I remember feeling so intimidated, so discouraged, so depressed walking into that room and thinking, man, our best days are behind us. We'll never see this place full again. The glory days have departed. Like I was just so, you know, just negative. And I would always have to call a security guard or a janitor to come and unlock the the building if I wanted to go in late at night because I didn't have the keys. And I would say, hey, can you come and unlock the front door of the church? And they were like, why didn't your dad give you the keys, Paul? And I was like, exactly. Why didn't he give me the keys? And I felt locked out physically of our church victory, but I also felt locked out spiritually from victory. I felt locked out from a life of victory, from experiencing hope, peace, joy, a sound mind. I felt locked out from even having vision to raise funds for the Dream Center. And I was being told by our accountant, hey, we can't afford to keep some of these places open. We might have to sell off the camp. We might have to shut down the school. We might have to, you know, find another church to run the dream center because we can't keep subsidizing all these areas. The church finances are just bleeding left and right. And I remember just feeling locked out. And this went on for years. My mom had stepped in as the interim pastor during that time that my dad passed away. And she said, Paul, the day will come where you will one day pastor this church And your dad saw it, even though he never told you. And I was like, are you serious? I'm the youngest. I'm the least qualified. I don't have the keys. I'm not the right guy. I'm battling depression. And she was like, when the day is right, you'll step in. But for now, I'm going to keep on helping our church get through these hard times. And my mom is my hero. Like she is the definition of perseverance. She carried our church through that painful season in, in 2009 through 2014. But I remember one night, it had been about three years since my dad passed. I was very discouraged. I called a security guard. I said, hey, can I get into the building? He said, Paul, I'm locking up doors on the other side of town. It's going to be a while before I can get over there. You'll just have to wait at least an hour. So I'm sitting outside of Victory and I'm like, I got to get in there. It's 10 p.m. at night. No one's there. And I'm like, I'm just going to break into this church. So I start trying to pound the glass door. I hurt my fist. You know, I'm like, gosh, one more reminder. I'm weak. I'm unqualified. I'm not strong enough. I'm the youngest. I'm least you know, qualified to do this. So then I pull out my wallet and I'm like, I'm going to use a credit card to shimmy through the crack of the door, pick the lock and get in. And when I did that, I broke my credit card. And I was like, once again, I'm broke. I'm messed up. There's no way I'm getting through this. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And then I, I pulled out my key ring and I was like, okay, I got my car key, got my house key, got a key to my parents' house. And I forgot I had this key that goes to my office. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stick this little key my dad gave me into the door. I'm going to wiggle it around and I'm going to yank that door open and try to break into victory. And I remember sticking that little key in and it fit perfectly. And I was like, what? And I remember turning the key and it unlocked the outside of this massive ministry. And I thought, did God just morph my key? And I was like, no way. Heaven just changed my key. And then I walked in our building and I was like, okay, I'm going to stick this key in the choir room to see if it works there and unlock the choir room. Then I was like, okay, I'm going to try the drum closet. Nobody has a key to the drum closet. Like that's like only the drummer and it unlocked the drum closet. And then I go, I think I might have the master key and I've had it this whole time and didn't know it. And I walk over to the main auditorium and I go, if this key works on this massive room that has intimidated me and scared me and the stage feels way too big for me and my dad's shoes are too big and depression is too big for me to beat and suicidal thoughts are too hard for me to conquer. If this key works on this door, everything changes. And I stuck it in the door and I unlocked the door to that auditorium. And I remember just weeping and I sat down on the stage and I looked at this empty room 
And I could almost feel my dad looking down from heaven laughing like, duh, you finally realized you got the master key. And I was like, dad, this whole time I've had the master key to victory. This whole time I've had the master key to victory and I didn't know I had it. And I remember sticking that master key in my Bible and I preached that night to an empty room. But I preached for the first time with confidence to those empty chairs. And I said, I'm not the only one with the master key. And I held that Bible open. I said, Christ in me, Christ in you is the master key to victory. And I began to preach this message that you have the victory over every lie of the enemy. Every door that you have felt locked out of, you have the master key. And every game the enemy has been playing in your head of depression, of hopelessness, fear, anxiety, suicide, things aren't going to get better, financial lack, you're unqualified. All these games the enemy's been playing, you've got the key to win. You've got the victory. And that night, I, for the first time, felt power. I felt boldness. I felt courage. I felt like even though I'm the youngest and maybe the weakest and least likely to be picked to pastor this church, that maybe I have what it takes because Christ in me is the master key. And something shifted. I started over the next eight months, I started a process of walking out of this depression that I had been in to the point where I never went back. And I talk in the book about a night where I was contemplating throwing my life away, standing on an overpass. But all of those stories sprung from that night where something clicked on the inside. And it was almost like the key turned on the inside of my head when it turned on the outside. And I started realizing, okay, God, God has a plan for my life. There's a blueprint for me to walk out of this depression. And it's one thing to grieve the loss of your loved one. It's another thing for that grief to last years and years and years. And there's this scripture in the Bible where God tells Samuel, you have grieved long enough over Saul. It's time to move forward. Fill your horn with oil. Go and anoint the next king of Israel. In other words, God was telling Samuel, like there is a season to grieve. There's a season to weep. There's a season to be sad. But that season is not meant to last years and years and years of your life. And what I realized is I had gone from sadness and grief into a depression that I was not coming out of. But that night, something shifted. And I talk about in the book, this kind of blueprint God gives us through scripture of walking out of depression, walking out of the mind games that keep people stuck and beginning to see the victory in your, in your mental and emotional health, but how that also leads to your outside world. Because once I started winning in here, our church started getting better, our services, our school. And today, all the areas that I thought we were going to lose are not only doing good, but many of them are thriving. And the finances turned around and we were able to rehire people that we had to let go. And it was like God started turning things around on the outside as things began to turn around on the inside. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad that you were like um, astute in telling us that even after things clicked for you when you had that moment at the church with the key. There was still another eight month journey that you went on to get clear, to get in, into an ideal place from where you were. Because sometimes we believe that, and sometimes it does, you can pray and in an instant, receive an instant healing. Sometimes it's a process and it's a journey. Uh, I'm curious about the process and the journey from the aspect of when this process and journey first began, you were a newlywed weeks into your marriage, not months, not years, weeks into your marriage. And your wife has had been by your side for the entire journey. How would you encourage those who are listening and watching that are married, uh, having the realization that maybe I need to do some work on me? How would you encourage them to invite their spouse into the process? Well, I, I was a mess. I was a mess. When my dad passed, I was not ready, nor was I mature enough to understand uh, how to properly invite my wife into the grief that I was feeling. She was grieving too because it was her pastor and she had grown up in our church. We knew each other since fourth grade. So her family went to our church. She went to our Bible school. She she even worked in the ministry before I did. She was uh, employed as one of the secretaries for the youth department. And so she was grieving the loss of her boss, her pastor, and a man she admired. But I was grieving the loss of my dad. And, and my pastor and the man I admired. And I remember like feeling in some ways, like you can't grieve as much as I'm grieving because he didn't mean as much to you as he meant to me, which is so wrong. Like I was so 
selfish in that moment because I could only see my pain. I couldn't see her pain. And I also didn't know that she wanted to help me through my pain to the degree that she wanted to help me. And so I was at times I was like not confiding in her. And instead I was going isolation, just going to the church by myself, feeling like I'm all alone in this battle. I got to cry with God, which I did. I needed to cry with God, but I also needed to really lean into my wife. And it wasn't until a counselor showed me like, hey, Paul, she's trying to help you with this. Like you guys need to do this together and you need to be more open and admit that you have not done the best job bringing her into the pain that you're walking through and recognizing she's had the pain too. Um, And so I did, I had to, I had to really like apologize, repent and say, babe, I'm sorry. I, you know, I could have done a better job bringing you into that place of grief. And, and as she began to help me more on the other side of that apology, I realized, man, this is what I needed. I needed someone that I was, that sees me every day, every night, every morning, besides just you know, you have your mentors, you have people that you can call, but they're not with you every day. Your spouse is with you every day. So they see the good, bad, and ugly. They're with you when, you know, when you are not your best self. And so you've got to be able to lean into their truth, their love. And they're like, Hey, Paul, you gotta, you gotta grow in this, man. Like you've got to like, don't let this steal years of your life while you sit over here mad that your dad's gone. Like, don't forget that there's people alive that are still with you that are for you and they want to walk with you. And I know you're missing these people, but don't let the missing of these people blind you from the presence of these people. And so my wife really helped me through that. Man, thank you for sharing that because that's huge. One, that you, you realized that you weren't doing it properly. And then two, that once you had that realization, you did something different to counteract it. And that leads me to my next question, because sometimes when we go through the tough valleys of life, we create our own coping mechanisms, whether that's just keep going, suppress, ignore. And sometimes those coping mechanisms can feel as though they worked, A, and B, uh, sometimes you find comfort in the coping mechanism. And the thought is, man, if I start this journey that Paul's telling me to go on, I got to go relive that stuff. I got to unbury that stuff. I got to feel those feelings all over again. And I don't know if I'm up for that. Why is it imperative to do that work, even though it may bring up some past pains that you're going to have to confront? I think that if we don't deal with the things that we've walked through in the past, feelings buried alive never die. And that was something a counselor said to me back in 2015. And this counselor was like, Paul, feelings buried alive never die. If you if you don't go back to some of those things that you just swept under the rug, those things are going to resurface in ugly ways. And this counselor was right. You know, she was in her late 60s, early 70s. She had once been a pastor, her and her husband, and they retired and they were helping young pastors and they still do. And they were meeting with me and my wife and they were like, you guys need to go back and reflect on feelings of rejection, pain, hurt that you walked through that first year of marriage, that first few months that your dad passed. But you also need to go back in your own personal lives and deal with feelings of rejection, hurt, pain anger at God, anger at at other people that you walked through when you were a kid, teenager, young adult. Because if you don't, it's going to come out at each other and at your children one day. And we got five kids now. So, uh, I mean, our house is busy and full. Our oldest is 10 and our youngest is two. And so thankfully, walking through that whole process, I was able to go back and go, man, yeah, even though my dad was my hero and he was amazing and he was my pastor. He was human and he let me down. And I did not deal with that until later on in life. Because when, when someone dies, you glorify them. You are like, they are the greatest and they've never done anything wrong. And I miss them and they're in heaven. But as time goes on, you realize like, yes, they, they were great. And I do miss them and I love them. But there were also times that they weren't great. And life is hard. And like, I think that was hard for me to admit. But going through that brought healing. 
Man, thank you. Now, grief is a type of mind game um, that people have walked through. But another one that you talk about is the mind game of comparison. You talked about the fact that you and Pastor Mike Tart are friends. He was on the show a few episodes back sharing a little bit of his story. But there's definitely room there as you all were first getting started for comparison to take you in a negative direction. You're in the same city. You're both taking over churches from predecessors. You're both working to gain momentum for kingdom advancement. There's so much opportunity for you guys to become competitors instead of friends. How did you, how did you advise people to not fall into the mind game of comparison? And if you find yourself there, how do you work yourself out to have a sound mind when it comes to the thief of comparison when it shows up? Whew. Well, I do a whole chapter on what you just said. And the chapter is called Everybody's Got a Buzz Light Year. And it springs from when I was maybe in middle school, high school, the movie Toy Story came out. And I remember seeing the movie and it was super fun. And I like, I loved the idea of the story. But what stood out to me was that Woody was confident in who he was, this toy. And, and he's, you know, he's got this placement in this kid's life. And then all of a sudden this new toy shows up that's flashier, can fly, Buzz Lightyear, right? And he all of a sudden feels threatened and he's jealous and he's angry. And the whole movie is about their relationship as two toys vying for the attention of, of the kid, but also the feeling of confidence, the feeling of like, I matter and I'm worthy. <laughs> and I think when in our, in our lives, anytime we look at someone else who has more than us, who's doing something better than us, who's who's experiencing more success than us, there is that tendency to go, I want what they have and I need what they have. And that jealousy, that envy, that green monster on the inside begins to surface. So Mike and I, we grew up as friends. Um, I say we grew up, we, we met each other when we were both 18, 19. And I was working in a band. I had a, a rock band. We were recording music and he was a producer in our city. And so I was like, hey, would you produce my next album? He was like, yeah. And he was running it all out of his mom's house. He had this whole like studio. So I recorded in his bedroom. Our band came over. We recorded at his mom's house. He's got Pro Tools. He's mixing and mastering the music. We were spending all this time together. And then fast forward from that moment, three or four years later, I graduate college. And both of us ended up becoming young adult pastors, college pastors at our churches back in 2008. And so I was running the college ministry for Victory. He was running the college ministry for Greenwood. And both of our young adult ministries just took off. Like he had a ministry called SoFly. I had a ministry called 3D. And all these young adults in the city started coming to his and to, to my service. And so we had each other preach at each other's services. And there was a good, healthy camaraderie between us and a sense of like, hey, let's keep reaching the young people in our city. Well, then my dad passes away and their church had gone through a bunch of different changes. And interestingly, I step in as pastor in 2014. He steps in as pastor of Greenwood in 2015, like three months later after me. And both of us were the same age. We both had the same amount of kids. We both were newly, you know, we had been married for five or six years and um, God started really blessing victory. Right. When I stepped in things like, God started stopping the bleeding from people who had left and the finances and our church started like getting stronger again, right around that same time, he invited me to come preach at Greenwood and I invited him to come preach at Victory and his church was going through hard times. People were not ready to embrace him yet as the pastor. And so he was facing, you know, a, a different type of battle than I was facing that first year. And he decided to change the name of their church. He was like, I'm going to rehaul this whole thing. We're going to call it transformation. Well, that threw off some of the old members who had been there for a while. And they were like, hey, I'm not sure if I'm a fan of where Mike's taking things. And and so I remember we would encourage each other and he would come over to different conferences that we were doing. And he would, you know, meet with different speakers we were bringing in. Um, but we were both kind of in the same, I say same season. I was I was in a season where things were growing and getting better. He was in a season where things weren't as much. 
And then 2016, something shifted. He preached a series called Relationship Goals. And I want to say a few months after that series, it went viral. And I remember seeing his Instagram account go from 3,000 followers to like 30,000 followers in a week. I was like, what's going on? And I was like, Buzz Lightyear over here is blowing up. And then he gets invited to preach at Elevation. And then he his YouTube channel goes from like 100 views to 10,000 views to 100,000 views to a million views to all these subscribers. And then I'm like watching him soar like a rocket. And I am like Woody on Toy Story, just like, who is this guy? He can't fly. That's falling with style. You know, I'm like literally critiquing all of his success. And yet him and I, we were still good friends. We would go and have breakfast or coffee, but he could tell. He's like, Paul's not being himself. Paul's coming across like like he's got a chip on his shoulder. And sure enough, after a year of just dealing with deep jealousy, envy, and, and here's the interesting thing. It wasn't that I didn't want him to succeed. It's that I wanted to succeed too. And then God began to strip me of selfish, vain ambition. God was like, Paul, do you want to succeed for the glory of God? Or do you want to succeed for the glory of Paul? Because what I'm doing in Mike, whether he asked for it or not, it's bringing glory to God and it's reaching people who are far from God to get it back in church. But your jealousy and envy is not for the glory of God. That's selfish ambition. And I went through a healthy crucible on the inside. In my mind, the mind games for me was I needed the Lord to strip me of jealousy, envy, comparison, uh, trying to measure my worthiness against another man's you know, success. And what comparison does is it either leads to pride or it leads to despair. It leads to a place of deep discouragement where you're like, man, I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as they are. Or if you compare yourself and you're doing really good and someone's not doing good, it's pride. It's like, hey, I'm better. But none of that's good. I mean, the, the, the enemy I really needed to beat was the inner me. Like Mike's not an enemy. It's not me versus Mike. It's me versus me. It's me versus who I was yesterday, the lazy me, the undisciplined me, the 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 lack of celebrating others me, the jealous me. Like I've got to beat me. I don't need to beat anyone else out there. But I had to discover that. And it took me about 16 months of dealing with the mind games of comparison, watching transformation blow up. I remember just thinking, you know, oh, they've got another service. They're running six services now. And I was so discouraged. And my wife was like, Paul, our church is doing good. God's providing for us. We have a great team. Our services are anointed. People are getting saved. People are getting ministered to at the altars. Why are you so focused on what God's doing through him? And I think this is what tripped up people in the Bible, like Saul, is that he got distracted from his mission, his purpose, and fixated on David, who was, you know, succeeding. But it was like, hold on, Saul didn't have to lose his mind over someone else's success. And I think that's where it was like, John the Baptist gives us a great example of this. And I talk about in the Bible, that when John the Baptist ministry started decreasing, and Jesus's ministry and water baptism started increasing, John said, that's good. He must become greater. I must become less. He must increase. I must decrease. And I remember coming to this place where I was like, God, I need to be content with what you've given me here. And I need to celebrate Mike from a genuine, authentic place. And I need to stop feeling threatened by any young guy or older guy or person who's my age or younger than me, older than me that succeeds because that is, that's a kingdom win. And a kingdom win is a win for all of us. And I remember just weeping and having this conversation with one of my mentors. And they were like, Paul, you need to repent and you need to go and talk to Mike and you need to repent to Mike. And so I called him up. It was really hard. We went to Metro Diner, a breakfast place here in Tulsa. And it was like the end of 2018. And um, at this time, I had three kids. I think he had two or three. And both of us didn't realize we were going to be expecting our fourth the next year. And, um, and so I remember meeting him at breakfast and I just said, how are you doing? He's like, dude, God's exploding the, the church. And he's like telling me all this stuff. And beforehand I would have been fuming with jealousy, listening to him talk. But this time I was sitting there and I was like, man, success, it can be trauma for someone 
who gets that famous that fast, the viral increase. And for the first time, I felt like I can celebrate my brother and I can sympathize that this success has also caused probably a total world change for his family to go from no one watching you to the whole world is watching you and everybody's, you know, there's always a backside to the blessing. There's a backside to the viralness. And I remember sitting there and it was like, God broke my heart in a healthy way to love Mike and celebrate him, pray for him. And I remember just sitting there. I was like, Mike, you probably noticed I've been different the last couple of years. And he was like, yeah, bro. He's like, I could tell you've been a little jealous. And I was like, okay, all right, hold on. Just, you know, and I was like, you're right. I said, I have been, man. And he's like, it's okay, Paul. He's like, I get it. He's like, I dealt with some of my own mind games when you were doing well your first year and I wasn't. And it was such a healing conversation between two good friends in the same city, pastoring churches, doing our best to lead our families. And we were both able to sit there and I was like, I just need to repent, man. I need to repent for jealousy, for comparison, for envy, for not wanting you to succeed. And for my own selfish ambition, I was like, and he goes, Paul, I forgive you. And um, he's like, we're in this together. We're going to be old together someday, having barbecues at each other's houses, swimming in each other's pools. And he's like, this is just one more step towards our relationship being more real. And so when my book was getting ready to come out, I was like, I've got to put this in the chapter. And he called me and he was like helping me on my book. And I told him about it. He was like, bro, I want to be there for your book launch. And we got to talk about this. So it's kind of cool that he's helping me with this book coming out with that whole story too. And, you know, you've, you've articulated some of the tough work that you've done, that you've put into this process and this journey, um, dealing with the mind games that we're trying to take you out. Talk about for those who are on the fence, like, man, I, I got to get a copy of this book, Mind Games. And uh, but I'm a little, a little nervous about the work that I got to do. Talk about the other side. Because of the work that you've done, what have been some of the benefits for you personally? More peace, more joy, um, better sleep, you know, and and less. Less need of public applause. I was telling my wife, for me, the success of this book is not if it sells a thousand books or 10,000 books or becomes a bestseller. The success of this book is that I was obedient to do what God asked me to do. And that comes from a sound mind. I think people who have to have a certain number to be happy, they don't have a sound mind. They, they're like they're, they're, they have racing thoughts. They have anxious over analytical thoughts of like, if I don't hit 10,000, I'm a failure. If I don't get this, I'm a failure. If I'm not making this much money by this time in my life, I failed. That's not true. That's not true because some of the people who've done all the things that I just said still feel unworthy, still feel angry, still can't sleep at night. Some of the richest people in the world are also the most miserable people, miserable people in the world. And I talk about in the book, one day I got invited to go play golf at Pebble Beach in uh, Carmel, California. It's like this notorious golf course. And uh, some of the wealthiest people in the world live on this golf course. And I remember I'm terrible at golf. My caddy, he meets me and I'm getting to golf with John Maxwell, right? The author of all these leadership books. And I was like honored that I get to golf with him. And um, the caddy... He, he, uh, he asked me how often I golf and I'm like, not that often. And he's like, what are you doing out here? And he sees me hit my first shot and he's like, I got nothing to tell you the rest of the day. Cause nothing I tell you is going to help you at all. Your game is terrible. So he said, let's just have a good time. I was like, okay. He's like, you know, I was the caddy for Arnold Palmer. I was like the drink. He was like, no, the human being Arnold Palmer was not a drink. I was like, who is he? He's like, he was a great golfer. And this guy's looking at me. He's like, you're an idiot. But I remember just laughing with this caddy across Pebble Beach. And he would point at houses. He's like, that's Gene Hackman's house, the actor. Oh, that's Clint Eastwood's house. Uh, that's Charles Schwab's house. And he would point at all these famous. And he goes, oh, that house is worth $80 million. I was like, what? $80 million. He's like, buying a house on Pebble Beach, Carmel, California, is like the wealthiest real estate in the world. And then he said this, he said, but can I tell you something, Paul? I was like, what? He said, they are miserable as hell. And I go, what? He said, they are so depressed. 
He's like, I go over to some of these guys. They're not happy. They're not happy with their fourth wife. They're not happy with their latest, you know, uh, investment that made them millions of dollars, should have made more. Sorry for saying hell. I, you can edit that out. Uh, but he just said that he's like, they're not happy. And he said, you can have all the money in the world, sell all the books in the world. Make You could be Jeff Bezos. You could be Elon Musk. You could be a public success. But if you are a private failure, nothing on the outside is good enough. And the private success comes from a, a healthy mind. And so the, the, when you say, what are the benefits of pursuing a healthy mind? Getting to a place where you don't have to have a certain number to be happy, where you don't have to have a certain applause from people, follower account, subscriber account, uh, salary, car, house, whatever it is, that you can be happy right now with what God's given you. And you have the master key to do that. And as you do that, you'll begin to see more outward victory in the other areas you want, but that won't be the reward. The reward will be your mind is good and your heart is good. And I think that's something we should all strive for. And a great way to begin that journey is your new book, Mind Games. Can you talk a little bit more in detail about what people will find inside the pages of your brand new book and also tell them how they can get their copy? Yes. Okay. So you can get the copy of Mind Games anywhere books are sold, Barnes and Noble, uh, Books a Million, Walmart, Target, wherever you go buy books. Um, or you could get it online, Amazon. You could get it on Audible. I read it to you. I personally give extra content on the Audible version or wherever you buy audiobooks, audiobooks.com. And as you read it, you're going to go through all kinds of different chapters um, where you'll hear personal reflection of my own journey. You'll hear stories about other people throughout history and the Bible that went on to do great things, but personally battled private battles of depression and anxiety and panic and worry and suicidal thoughts and found victory and came out on the other side on top. And so as you read through this book, I pray and I believe it will give you encouragement, hope. You'll probably laugh a little bit and probably cry a little bit. I was talking with someone just today who said, hey, I'm already three chapters in and I think I've cried like five times. And I was like, hey, that's, I mean, the book is is filled with some tear-filled stories, but it's also filled with some humorous ones too. So I pray it encourages you. And at the start of the year, while people are making goals to get healthy, get your mind healthy. While people are making goals to win in 2024, whether it's to read through their whole Bible or make a certain amount of money or sell a, a certain stuff, like let's get our minds and our hearts healthy this year above all else. And so invest in your mental and emotional health. Get the book Mind Games anywhere books are sold. Awesome. And we'll be sure to have a link to the book in the show notes of this podcast. You can look in the show notes or if you're watching us on YouTube, just look in the description box and there will be a link there. So, Paul, can you do us a favor um, for everybody listening and watching? Would you mind praying over everybody as they embark on this journey for a healthier mind um, as they move forward in life? Yes, sir. Lord, I just pray for every listener out there today. Every person who's tuned into my voice right now, I just speak life. I speak hope. I speak healing. I speak peace right now. Sound mind. Lord, I thank you. You've not given them a spirit of fear or a spirit of intimidation, but power, love, and a sound mind. I thank you that they have the mind of Christ. And Lord, we take captive every thought that's not from you, that's been trying to uh, just set itself up in people's minds, any stronghold of, of just generational curses, of belief systems that aren't lining up with your word today, we just begin to tear those down and we just speak victory in people's minds and their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I know people are going to be keeping up with you past this episode. So if they want to keep tabs on you, where can they find you? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram, just Paul Doherty, P A U L D A U G H E R T Y. Same thing on Facebook or Twitter, X, whatever you call it. Um, they can also go to my website, pauldoherty.org. And on the website there, they'll find all the sermons I've preached, more content from the book, more resources. I've got a lot of music that I've put out. So they can find all my music right there on pauldoherty.org. And we'll be sure to have all those links available for you as well. So you can keep up with Paul. Thank you so much for coming on the His and Her Money Show and dropping all of this wisdom on us today, sir. Hey, thank you, Talat. Appreciate you, man.
There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another edition of the His and Her Money Show is in the books. Speaking of books, make sure you go get your copy of Mind Games by Paul Darty. It will change your life. You need it. We need it because it's time for us to win when it comes to our mental health. It's time for us to stop dropping the ball and taking care of ourselves, like we spend so much energy taking care of others. We have a link to it in the show notes of this episode so you can get started right away. Remember, we do this work not for entertainment, but to equip you. Now the ball is in your court to do the work that you need to do so that you can take dominion over your money and your life. That's all we got for this time, guys. It's been great. Till next time. Peace.